And welcome back to Stasis, everybody. Good news, John is over his loss for now because I reset the save and the crying sound stops when you do that. Uh, right now we are stuck in the area where the bodies get dumped and where they mix in with the acid and eventually become fertilizer for the rest of the hybrids. Now I have good news and bad news. The good news is there are only four PDAs left in the game. The bad news is they're all in this video. Let's get started. This is Dwayne H. Jones, and he works as an engineer in this section of the ship. And in his former life, he had a family, but his wife entered his name for him into the Progressive Assisted Suicide Lottery, which uh, you send your name into the government, they give you $10,000 cash, and there's a slight chance your name might be picked and you'll have to be killed. He had no say in this, and sure enough, his name does get picked, so he runs the hell away, joins Kane Corporation as an engineer, and he winds up being a level 3 engineer so he can see some parts of Project Seed, and he has to clean up some weird shit, but nobody talks to him or asks questions, so he doesn't really care. He spends a lot of time with the dead bodies that fall into the acid vats, although they stop doing that at one point. And he ends by saying the acid itself could be his ticket out of here, out of this life at least, and gives one last fuck you to his wife. Now then, how does this help us get out of this area? Well, uh, you can interact with Dwayne's body, which is completely covered by a hazmat suit, and when you do, uh, part of his hazmat suit falls off. Particularly, the glove of the hazmat suit, so let's take that. Take note how it says it's an impermeable glove. Now, we can't really go anywhere except along this walkway, and uh, there's a little note about how tough those metal bars are, but there's this little flow of acid coming down from uh, this faucet-looking thing in the ceiling. So we're going to take that glove, and we're going to try and catch ourselves some acid, and somehow not burn our hands. Okay, I'm going to you Start. No lights. Keep your head down, and stay away from the walls. And listen, you'll hear them before you see them. Yes, okay. Okay. And while Taya's taking care of that, we're going to take this glove full of acid, which is somehow uh, not melting and leaking acid itself, and we're going to pour it over these metal bars. Somehow. I say somehow because once you uh, melt these bars away, now you have a melted hazmat glove. So it must have been really convenient timing that the glove held its form just long enough for us to melt those bars. Too close. That was too goddamn close. Calm yourself. Panic and you won't make it. Focus. Breathe. I'm in a storage locker. I don't think they saw me. I'll contact you when I'm clear. I'll be waiting. Warning. The oxygen processor has experienced a critical failure. Report to the prisoner center. center for immediate evacuation. I don't know how many of you caught it, but John Marichak's voice actor slipped a little on his accent and said, Calm yourself. He's from the UK. Uh, his name's Ryan Cooper. He was also in Colat and The Highwayman. Anyway, we're going to get this fake arm off of this corpse. Because we're going to need it for an upcoming puzzle. And oh, hello, hybrid. Anyway, um, we need to get this fuse box working so that door can open. But if you try just taking the metal fake arm... Um, by the way, I'm going to save, so you should probably know what's about to happen. If you just take the fake arm and try uh, connecting two fuse boxes with it, this is what happens. And that is how you can get the fried achievement. Anyway, now for how we can do this without dying. Now we're going to 
have to insulate this somehow, but we do have that melted hazmat glove. So we're going to wrap the glove around the arm just enough in that one little space that it protects us. I'm in the limb regeneration lab. Uh, one step at a time. How close are you to Ellen? Uh, she's in a storage bay. Two floors up. I'm close. Damn, Taya's really hauling ass. So, the door doesn't stay open long enough for us to go through it, so we'll have to do something with the gears on the wall. Specifically, stop them so we can move through. Um, oh, by the way, you can mouse over corpses in this room and get more backer names. But anyway, uh, all we have is the uh, ID tag for John. So, I don't know what I was thinking then. That doesn't work. You actually can't solve this puzzle until you run to the middle of the room. And now that that hybrid is dead from falling in indeterminable height, we can interact with it. And we can still interact with it, so why not? I'm in the cargo bay. I'm close. Five yards. Four. Three. Got her. What? What is it? Is she okay? Yes. Yes. Sorry, John. She's fine. Still in stasis. I'm going to have to find a way to move into the hangar. <sighs> Please be careful. Keep her under. The last time I woke someone up. Now, since John's ID tag didn't work for stopping the cogs, well, why not just lodge some hybrid intestines in there and see what happens? Can't be any worse than not working, right? And that gives us just enough time to slip through into the next room. Kind of makes you wonder what hybrid intestines are made of that they can hold up against the cogs. Almost at the hangar. John, I need to explain the situation. <coughs> well, well, Miss Hensley. And it looks like you brought our friend along. Milan! Taya! Oh dear god, Milan's got Taya. I better hurry up and read this PDA and this computer. No, sadly I'm not kidding. Say hello to Jared Winslow. He's a god-fearing man who's prone to violent outbursts, which is a great combination. He has this guy he works with named Scotty who's kind of snooty and stuck up and doesn't really care for him much at all. He finds an old transport pod which the groom like used to use to get around until they switch to the rapid transport system, but uh, he decides he's going to fix it up and get it working again. Scotty throws a bucket of water on him as an April Fool's prank, and Jared hits him with a wrench, really hard, and then says, No, that's not the get back. I'm going to pay you back for that later. And he does so by setting Scotty's favorite book on fire. He mentions the pod's almost ready, and then reminisces about how he and his kid brother Judd would used to uh, fix stuff up. But then they were working on this old car, and, well, Jared got angry, yada yada yada, the jack broke loose, and Judd got crushed to death. And Jared's like, oh, well, God knows I didn't mean to do that. Scotty continues to piss him off by saying, oh, the pod won't work, and then he wonders why God lets Scotty live. Soon the fungus starts growing everywhere and they have to scrub really hard to try and get it all off. And he mentions that ever since burning Scotty's book, he's been nicer to him. In fact, Scotty gets so nice that he says, Oh, well, the Bible must have done this. Thanks, God. Of course, right after that, the ship goes on level 7 lockdown and he and Scotty shut down all the transport baskets, the umbilical bridge. People are starting to go hungry and they're looking for rations. And then Scotty apparently was too loud for Jared, and, well, to make a long story short, he juds him, and then he tucks his body away somewhere. Then after a while he starts hearing voices, cracking jokes, laughing, crying, and he has a screwdriver, which people tell him that he can fix just about anything with, so he goes, can I fix myself? And then it's implied that he killed himself. 
I'm assuming the body down there is supposed to be Jared, but they don't give a description for his corpse. Like, they don't say, oh, there's a screwdriver sticking out of his throat, or something like that. So we're just going to head over to this computer terminal. And this has a bunch of test data from when he was trying to get the pod working. Namely, uh, most of his struggles are actually with the terminal itself, just trying to get commands working. In fact, at one point, he apparently says, fuck you, you ain't a goddamn radio to the terminal. However, he does eventually get it fully operational, and that is exactly what we are going to use to get around now. So, let's go to pod controls and open this baby up. Well, that certainly seems nice and inviting. Let's hop right in. Now, one note about this thing is there are two different places we can go to for the moment. And you're about to see them when the control panel pops up. There we are. We can go to the disposal area or the visitor center expansion. I'm going to the disposal area first because if you go to the visitor center expansion, uh, there will be a point where you can't progress. You'll find a puzzle and then not have the means to solve it. So you have to go here first. I'm also only showing that transport sequence once because you don't really need to see it anymore. A hive? These creatures are following their base instincts. Breeding. Eating. This is, the this is exactly where I wanted to end up. Uh, there were a bunch of corpses in this area in particular, embedded in the wall, in the floor, and uh, it's more backer names as far as I know. As we go through this, you're going to see also hybrids embedded in the walls and the floor. The tower. Maintenance and repair and solid waste disposal facility is overdue by 9,125 days. That's 25 years for those keeping count. I've never seen anything as disgusting as this place. I repeat, this is the final board and call for shade level 9 employees. Thank you. Even though there are hybrids present in this area and they're moving around, uh, they're all embedded in the environment, so they actually pose no threat to John. A heavy loader. Looks like it was sealed in during construction. That heavy loader is the main reason we're here, so let's go ahead and run past all of these hybrids. I mean, you can walk past them, but I'm trying to save time. And grab the plasma cutter that's attached to the side of it. Now, if you keep your mouse there, the hand icon pops up again, so let's interact with this again and you're going to see an open power cell casing in the side of the heavy loader. So we can just reach in and grab that extra power cell. Now both of these things are going to come into play uh, for helping us get to the visitor center area. I mean, the pod says that we can go there, but technically we can't really go there yet. You'll see what I mean when we get there. First things first, however, we're not going to the Visitor Center expansion just yet. Instead, we are going back to the janitorial office, because we have some unfinished business. And uh, I'm going to skip the transportation scene, because you've already seen that. But I am going to leave in the part where the pod comes back. Just because. Now, some of you might have noticed that there's a power pad on the floor in front of that big-ass refrigeration unit, and we haven't used it yet. Well, now we have a tool that is powered by that pad, the plasma cutter. So, without further ado, let's just blast open the refrigeration unit. By the way, you, if you walk in front of it, uh, Marichek's character model goes underneath it, which is kind of weird. Anyway. Say hello to Scott Tanaka. This is where Jared stashed his body. Don't know why we needed the plasma cutter to open it. Although, I didn't see a handle, did you? Anyway, Scott is from a wealthier family and clearly has a superiority complex over Jared, which just makes him even angrier than usual. He mentions that the Groom Lake has been a pleasure to be on, much more entertaining than his family's private island. Haha, <laughs> that'll 
certainly change. He plans his April Fool's prank two weeks in advance, and the plan is just pour a glass of water on Jared. And Jared freaks out, chases him down the corridor with a wrench slicing open his forehead, and remember, Jared's not done with him. He bribes Dr. Graham into obtaining Jared's medical records and finds out, yeah, he's mentally ill. In fact, he murdered his brother by crushing him with a car and then claimed it was the will of the Lord and says, you know what, I should stay on Jared's good side. He says he's starting to miss his father's mansion more and more because he's used to being waited on hand and foot and can't take the challenge of walking to the mess hall for food. Yes, really. He questions Jared's hobby of repairing that transport pod to which he gets the death stare. And then shortly after, Jared burned his favorite book, which is a thesaurus. He ripped it out of his hands, set it on fire, and then ran away screaming April Fools, by the way, this was in August, while waving the burning pages above his head. Without his thesaurus, he's struggling to write his PDA entries and says, how can anyone respect me if I don't sound smart? Later, he runs into Dr. Graham, who says, Hey, you don't sound like a pretentious asshole anymore. And he says, Oh, maybe I should just talk like an ordinary person. He and Jared start scrubbing off that fungus that's getting everywhere, and then Jared apologizes to him for losing his temper, and Scotty apologizes to Jared for the stuff he's done, and says, I don't remember the last time I did that. Then the ship goes on lockdown, and Jared reveals to Scotty that he's had a bunch of rations tucked away, and he shares some with Scotty. And Scotty goes, I'm putting you in charge of Tanaka Investment Charity, which doesn't exist yet, but it will. Engineering ends up going on complete lockdown, and they say they have to keep whatever those things are, probably the hybrids, away from the generators. He says, I don't think we're going to see the light of day again, but at least when I die, it'll be with the only real friend I ever had. Again, remember what Jared does to him. Well, I can think of only one thing to do after reading all of that, and that is curb stomp Scott's body until his head is a fine paste, and then take one of his eyeballs. Again, this would probably make more sense if I showed you what's in the visitor center extension first, but, you know, saving time. There's a little hand to interact with the body again, but it doesn't do anything, so we're just going to go ahead and hop into the pod, and now... We're going to head to the Visitor Center expansion, where everything I've been doing in this area is finally going to start making sense. Again, nothing changes with this transport sequence, so we can just skip over that. And there it is, the heavy loader. This is why we were gathering all those parts from before. Now, it's positioned directly in front of a bunch of scaffolding, because we're still in the extension, that scaffolding is uh, separating us from the visitor center proper. Gotta find another way out. And of course that power loader is the way out. We're not going to interact with it directly. There's a loose panel on the side of it we can interact with. And there's a retinal scanner over it. This is why we needed Scott's eye. Now, you can't actually interact with it from here. You have to back out, take the eyeball, and then use it on the loose panel. That seemed a little unnecessary, but once you do that, the retinal scanner slides back, and the power cell housing opens up. So, we can take that power cell we got from the other heavy loader, and just sort of cram it in here. Whatever, it's going to fit. And now it's started up. So, let's go ahead and climb inside and, uh, see how much damage we can do with this thing. Kind of reminds me of the backlash in Blast Corps, but next time on Stasis, the final encounter.